Ancient Science, Doctrines, and Beliefs Articles by H. P. Blavatsky The Babel of Modern Thought The Seventeen Raid Sun Disco Mysterious Race Christmas Then and Christmas Now The Eighth Wonder The Theory of Cycles Ancient Doctrines Vindicated by Modern Prophecy H. P. Blavatsky Series No. 1 Theosophy Company, Mysore, Private Ltd. Bangalore 560004 Objects of the Theosophical Movement I to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity, without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color, to the study of ancient and modern religions, philosophies, and sciences, and the demonstration of the importance of such study, and three the investigation of the unexplained laws of nature and the psychical powers latent in man. The articles of H. P. Blavalsky and W. Q. Judge which originally appeared in The Theosophist, Lucifer, and The Path, were issued in pamphlet form by The Theosophy Company, Los Angeles, USA. For the benefit of students and inquirers in India, these are now being reprinted in an Indian edition. Reprint edition, 1981 by courtesy, The Theosophy Company, 245, West 33rd St., Los Angeles, California. 90,007, USA printed by V. N. Iyer at Commercial Printing House, 41-1, 3rd Main Road, Gandhinagar, Bangalore 560009 and published by J. M. Tijoruwala for Theosophy Company, Mysore, Private Limited, 4, Sir Krishna Rao Road, Basavangudi, Bangalore 560004. Forward in the Babe, of Modern Thought, which appeared in Lucifer for February, 1891, HPB once again presents evidence to show that the ancients anticipated modern knowledge in numerous ways, that their understanding was deeper and more philosophical than 19th century theories, and that the scholars of her time were either reluctant or refused entirely to admit that the initiates of Antiquity could know more of the meaning of old esoteric texts than European Orientalists. The occult reading given by HPB of the biblical account of the Tower of Babel also shows how knowledge of occult symbolism transforms the meaning of exoteric texts. Of particular interest in the second part of this article is the discussion of the controversy between the evolutionists and the Kantian positivists, pointing out the limitations of both sides. Reconciliation between the two lies not so much in critical analysis of either position, but in the larger perspective of the ancient teaching which, HPB says, is that aggregate of the subjective and objective facts which form the consistent, logical, harmonious whole called by us the wisdom religion. The 17 raid sun disc gives H.P.B's brief comment in the Theosophist for December, 1879, on the report by a reader of finding in Central America a monumental symbol of the sun. With 17 rays, similar to corresponding Egyptian monuments. HPB makes this report an occasion for confirming her correspondence idea of an Atlantean link between ancient Americans and Egyptians, going on to discuss the various deluges and the cataclysms which mark off the major cycles of race evolution. The peculiar endowment of obscure races with particular faculties or powers is the subject of a mysterious race, first published in The Theosophist, December, 1883. This brief account is another example of H.P.B's consistent effort to give practical evidence in support of the occult teachings. Christmas Then and Christmas Now, which also appeared in the December, 1879, Theosophist, links the holy day of the ancient science, doctrines, and beliefs Christians with various pagan observances, connecting it with the day on which the sun gods of ancient times were said to be born. The symbolism of the divine babe is shown to be pagan, also, antedating Christianity. HPB concludes with a tale reprinted from a New York newspaper, contrasting the true spirit of sacrifice with the morally indifferent quality of fashionable religion in the 19th century. In The Eighth Wonder, HPB pays her respects to the Eiffel Tower, calling it a gigantic iron carrot, wondrous in size, useless in its object. Her observations on this subject recall similar expressions in Civilization, The Death of Art and Beauty.
The Eighth Wonder was published in Lucifer for October, 1891. A few months after H.P.B.S. death. In this article she contrasts the splendor and excellence of ancient monuments, arts, and industry with the crude industrialism of the 19th century. The reality of cycles cycles of every sort is a central consideration in theosophical philosophy, making it natural for HPB to make extended note of the work of a German scholar on this neglected subject. She titled this discussion The Theory of Cycles and published it in The Theosophist for July, 1880. She says that astrologers of the distant past possessed genuine occult knowledge and knowledge lost to modern practitioners and based their predictions on accurate observations of recurring cycles. The soothsayers and augurs of antiquity, she adds, were the historians and astronomers of their time, although in those days the practice of true science was restricted to the few. After these introductory suggestions she reproduces from an article in a Prussian journal a wealth of statistical material on cyclic spurts of historical development, some of which involve wars and revolutions. That occult or cabalistic knowledge is not only mystical, but may have quite practical application, as in the prediction of earthquakes, is the content of ancient doctrines vindicated by modern prophecy, which appeared in the Theosophist for May, 1881. The accuracy of the anticipations of Rudolf Falb, a German astronomer and editor, is indeed impressive, and HPB suggests that he founded his method on secrets known to medieval mystics and fire philosophers. Lucifer, February, 1891 The Babel of Modern Thought Oh yeah lords of truth who are cycling in eternity save me from the annihilation in this region of the two truths. Egyptian ritual of the dead it hat the world moves in cycles, and events repeat themselves therein, is an old, yet ever new truism. It is new to most, firstly, because it belongs to a distinct group of occult aphorisms in partal bus infidelum, and our present-day rabbis and Pharisees will accept nothing coming from that Nazareth, secondly, because those who will swallow a camel of whatever size, provided it hails from orthodox or accepted authorities, will strain and kick at the smallest gnat, if only its buzz comes from theosophical regions. Yet this proposition about the world cycles and ever-recurring events, is a very correct one. It is one, moreover, that people could easily verify for themselves. Of course, the people meant here are men who do their own thinking, not those others who are satisfied to remain, from birth till death, pinned, like a thistle fastened to the coattail of a country parson, to the beliefs and thoughts of the goody-goody majority. We cannot agree with a writer, was it Gilpin, who said that the grandest truths are often rejected, not so much for want of direct evidence, as for want of inclination to search for it. This applies but to a few. Nine-tenths of the people will reject the most overwhelming evidence, even if it be brought to them without any trouble to themselves, only because it happens to clash with their personal interests or prejudices, especially if it comes from unpopular quarters. We are living in a highly moral atmosphere, high sounding in words. Put to the test of practice, however, the morality of this age in point of genuineness and reality is of the nature of the black skin of the negro minstrel, assumed for show and pay, and washed off at the close of every performance. In sober truth, our opponents advocates of official science, defenders of orthodox religion, and the 2D quantity of the detractors of theosophy who claim to oppose our works on grounds of scientific evidence, public good and truth, strongly resemble advocates in our courts of law miscalled of justice. These in their defense of robbers and murderers, forgers and adulterers, deem it to be their duty to browbeat, confuse and bespatter all who bear witness against their clients, and will ignore, or if possible, suppress, all evidence which goes to incriminate them. Let ancient wisdom step into the witness box herself, and prove that the goods found in the possession of the prisoner at the bar, were taken from her own strong box, and she will find herself accused of all manner of crimes, fortunate if she escape being branded as a common fraud, and told that she is no better than she should be. What member of our society can wonder, then, that in this our age, preeminently one of shams and shows, 
the Theosophists' teachings so, miss, called, seem to be the most unpopular of all the systems now to the fore, or that materialism and theology, science and modern philosophy, have arrayed themselves in holy alliance against theosophical studies perhaps because all the former are based on chips and broken up fragments of that primordial system. Cotton complains somewhere, that the metaphysicians have been learning their lesson for the last four, thousand years, and that it is now high time that they should begin to teach something. But, no sooner is the possibility of such studies offered, with the complete evidence into the bargain that they belong to the oldest doctrine of the metaphysical philosophy of mankind, then, instead of giving them a fair hearing at least, the majority of the complainers turn away with a sneer. And the cool remark, oh, you must have invented all you say yourself. Dear ladies and gentlemen, has it ever occurred to you, how truly grand and almost divine would be that man or woman, who, at this time of the life of mankind, could invent anything, or discover that which had not been invented and known ages before. The charge of being such an inventor would only entitle the accused to the choicest honors. For show us, if you can, that mortal who in the historical cycle of our human race has taught the world something entirely new. To the proud pretensions of this age. Occultism the real Eastern occultism, or the so-called Esso. Herrick doctrine answers through its ablest students, Indeed all your boasted knowledge is but the reflex action of the bygone past. At best, you are but the modern popularizers of very ancient ideas. Consciously and unconsciously you have pilfered from old classics and philosophers, who were themselves but the superficial recorders cautious and incomplete, owing to the terrible penalties for divulging the secrets of initiation taught during the mysteries of the primaeval wisdom. Avant. Your modern sciences and speculations are but the ratio fait dishes of antiquity, the dead bones, served with a sauce piquant of crass materialism, to disguise them, of the intellectual repasts of the gods. Ragan was right in saying in his Maconnery occult, that humanity only seems to progress in achieving one discovery after the other, as in truth, it only finds that which it had lost. Most of our modern inventions for which we claim such glory, are, after all, things people were acquainted with three and four thousand years back. One lost to us through wars, floods and fire, their very existence became obliterated from the memory of man. And now modern thinkers begin to rediscover them once more. Allow us to recapitulate a few of such things and thus refresh your memory. Deny, if you can, that the most important of our present sciences were known to the ancients. It is not Eastern literature only, and the whole cycle of those esoteric teachings which an overzealous Christian Kabbalist, in France, has just dubbed the accursed sciences that will give you a flat denial, but profane classical literature, as well. The proof is easy. Are not physics and natural sciences but an amplified reproduction of the works of Anaxagoras, of Empedocles, Democritus, and others? All that is taught now, was taught by these philosophers then. For they maintained even in the fragments of their work still extant that the universe is composed of eternal atoms which, moved by a subtle internal fire, combine in millions of various ways. With them, this fire was the divine breath of the universal mind, but now, it has become with the modern philosophers no better than a blind and senseless force. Furthermore they taught that there was neither life nor death, but only a constant destruction of form, produced by perpetual physical transformations. This has now become by intellectual transformation, that one the learned Belgian Mason would be nearer the mark by adding a few more ciphers to his 4,000 years. Which is known as the physical correlation of forces, conservation of energy, law of continuity, and what not, in the vocabulary of modern science. But what's in a name? or in newfangled words and compound terms, once that the identity of the essential ideas is established. Was not Descartes indebted for his original theories to the old masters, to Lucippus and Democritus, Lucretius, Anaxagoras, and Epicurus? These taught that the celestial bodies were formed of a multitude of atoms, whose vortical motion existed from eternity, which met, and, rotating together, 
the heaviest were drawn to the centers, the lightest to the circumferences, each of these concretions was carried away in a fluidic matter, which, receiving from this rotation an impulse, the stronger communicated it to the weaker concretions. This seems a tolerably close description of the Cartesian theory of elemental vortices taken from Anaxagoras and some others, and it does look most suspiciously like the vortical atoms of Sir W. Thomson. Even Sir Isaac Newton, the greatest among the great, is found constantly mirroring a dozen or so of old philosophers. In reading his works one sees floating in the air the pale images of the same Anaxagoras and Democritus, of Pythagoras, Aristotle, Tamses of Locris, Lucretius, Macrobius, and even our old friend Plutarch. All these have maintained one or the other of these propositions, one, that the smallest of the particles of matter would be sufficient owing to its infinite divisibility to fill infinite space, two, that there exist two forces emanated from the universal soul, combined in numerical proportions, the centripetal and centrifugal forces, of the latter-day scientific saints, three, that there was a mutual attraction of bodies, which attraction causes the latter to, what we now call, gravitate, and keeps them within their respective spheres, for, they hinted most unmistakably at the relation existing between the weight and the density, or the quantity of matter contained in a unit of mass, and, five, taught that the attraction, gravitation, of the planets toward the sun is in reciprocal proportion to their distance from that luminary. Finally, is it not a historical fact that the rotation of the Earth and the heliocentric system were taught by Pythagoras not to speak of Hystus, Heraclides, Ecphantus, and C, over two thousand years before the despairing and now famous cry of Galileo, pound per, s e muav? Did not the priests of Etruria and the Indian rishis still earlier, know how to attract lightning, ages upon ages before even the astral Sir B. Franklin was formed in space? Euclid is honored to this day perhaps, because one cannot juggle as easily with mathematics and figures, as with symbols and words bearing on unprovable hypotheses. Archimedes had probably forgotten more in his day, than our modern mathematicians, astronomers, geometric eons, mechanic eons, hydrostatic eons, and opticians ever knew. Without Archidas, the disciple of Pythagoras, the application of the theory of mathematics to practical purposes would, perchance, remain still unknown to our grand era of inventions and machinery. Needless to remind the reader of that which the Aryans knew, as it is already recorded in the Theosophist and other works obtainable in India. Wise was Solomon in saying that there is no new thing under the sun, and that everything that is hath been already of old time, which was before us save, perhaps, the theosophical doctrines which the humble writer of the present is charged by some with having invented. The prime origin of this, very complementary, accusation is due to the kind efforts of the SPR. It is the more considerate and kind of this world famous, and learned society of researches, as its scribes seem utterly incapable of inventing anything original themselves even in the way of manufacturing a commonplace illustration. If the inquisitive reader turns to the article which follows, he will have the satisfaction of finding a curious proof of this fact, in a reprint from old Isaac Walton's Lives, which our contributor has entitled MRS. Dunn's Astral Body. Thus even the scientifically accurate Cambridge Dons are not, it seems, above borrowing from an ancient book, and not only fail to acknowledge the dead, but even go to the trouble of presenting it to the public as new original matter, without even the complement of inverted com. Moss. And thus all along. In short, it may be said of the scientific theories, that those which are true are not new, and those which are new are not true, or are at least, very dubious. It is easy to hide behind merely working hypotheses, but less easy to maintain their plausibility in the face of logic and philosophy. To make short work of a very big subject, we have but to institute a brief comparison between the old and the new teachings. That which modern science would make us believe, is this, the atoms possess innate and immutable properties. That which esoteric, and also exoteric, Eastern philosophy calls divine spirit substance, 
Purusha Prakriti, or eternal spirit matter, one inseparable from the other, modern science calls force and matter, adding as we do, for it is a Vedantic conception, that, the two being inseparable, matter is but an abstraction, an illusion rather. The properties of matter are, by the Eastern occultists, summed up in, or brought down to, attraction and repulsion, by the scientists, to gravitation and affinities. According to this teaching, the properties of complex combinations are but the necessary results of the composition of elementary properties, the most complex existences being the physico-chemical automata, called men. Matter from being primarily scattered and inanimate, begets life, sensation, emotions and will, after a whole series of consecutive gropings. The latter non-felicitous expression, belonging to Mr. Tyndall, forced the philosophical writer, Dolby of II, to criticize the English scientist in very disrespectful terms, and forces us in our turn, to agree with the former. Matter, or anything equally conditioned, once that it is declared to be subject to immutable laws, cannot grope. But this is a trifle when compared with dead or inanimate matter, producing life, and even psychic phenomena of the highest mentality. Finally, a rigid determinism reigns over all nature. All that which has once happened to our automatical universe, had to happen, as the future of that universe is traced in the smallest of its particles or atoms. Return these atoms, they say, to the same position and order they were in at the first moment of the evolution of the physical cosentos. And the same universal phenomena will be repeated in precisely the same order, and the universe will once more return to its present conditions. To this, logic and philosophy answer that it cannot be so, as the properties of the particles vary and are changeable. If the atoms are eternal and matter indestructible, these atoms can never have been born, hence, they can have nothing innate in them. Theirs is the one homogeneous, and we add divine, substance, while compound molecules receive their properties, at the beginning of the life cycles or manvantaras, from within without. Organisms cannot have been developed from dead or inanimate matter, as, firstly, such matter does not exist, and secondly, philosophy proving it conclusively, the universe is too in the Review Philosophique of 1883, where he translates such gropings by autonomous success sips. Not subjected to fatality. As occult science teaches that the universal process of differentiation begins anew after every period of Mahapralaya, there is no reason to think that it would slavishly and blindly repeat itself. Immutable laws last only from the incipient to the last stage of the universal life, being simply the effects of primordial, intelligent, and entirely free action. For theosophists, as also for Dr. Pirogov, Dolbeyev and many a great independent modern thinker, it is the universal, and to us impersonal because infinite, mind, which is the true and primordial demiurge. What better illustrates the theory of cycles, than the following fact? Nearly 700 years BC, in the schools of Thales and Pythagoras, was taught the doctrine of the true motion of the earth, its form, and the whole heliocentric system. And in 317 AD Lactantius, the preceptor of Crispus Caesar, the son of the emperor Constantine, is found teaching his pupil that the earth was a plain surrounded by the sky, itself composed of fire and water. Moreover, the venerable church father warned his pupil against the heretical doctrine of the earth's globular form, as the Cambridge. And Oxford Father Dons warn their students now, against the pernicious and superstitious doctrines of theosophy such as universal mind, reincarnation, and so on. There is a resolution tacitly accepted by the members of the T.S. for the adoption of a proverb of King Solomon, paraphrased for our daily use, a scientist is wiser in his own conceit than seven theosophists that can render a reason. No time, therefore, should be lost in argue with them, but no endeavor, on the other hand, should be neglected to show up their mistakes and blunders. The scientific conceit of the Orientalists especially of the youngest branch of these the Assyriologists and the Egyptologists is indeed phenomenal. Hitherto, some credit was given to the ancients to their philosophers and initiates, 
at any rate of knowing a few things that the moderns could not rediscover. But now even the greatest initiates are represented to the public as fools. Here is an instance. On pages 15, 16, and 17, introduction, in the Hibbert lectures of 1887 by Prof. Sace, on the ancient Babylonians, the reader is brought face to face with a conundrum that may well stagger the unsophisticated admirer of modern learning. Complaining of the difficulties and obstacles that meet the Assyriologist at every step of his studies, after giving the dreary catalogue of the formidable struggles of the interpreter to make sense of the inscriptions from broken fragments of clay tiles, the professor goes on to confess that the scholar who has to read these cuneiform characters, is often likely to put a false construction upon isolated passages, the context of which must be supplied from conjecture, p. 14. Notwithstanding all this, the learned lecturer places the modern Assyriologist higher than the ancient Babylonian initiate, in the knowledge of symbols and his own religion. The passage deserves to be quoted in toto, it is true that many of the sacred texts were so written as to be intelligible only to the initiated, but the initiated were provided with keys and glosses, many of which are in our hands. We can penetrate into the real meaning of documents which to him, the ordinary Babylonian, were a sealed book. Nay, more than this, the researches that have been made during the last half century into the creed and beliefs of the nations of the world both past and present, have given us a clue to the interpretation of these documents which even the initiated priests did not possess. The above, the italics being our own, may be better appreciated when thrown into a syllogistic form. Major premise, the ancient initiates had keys and glosses to their esoteric texts, of which they were the inventors. Minor premise, our orientalists have many of these keys. Conclusion, ergo, the orientalists have a clue which the initiates themselves did not possess ii into what were the initiates, in such a case, initiated. And who invented the blinds, we ask. Few orientalists could answer this query. We are more generous, however, and may show in our next that, into which our modest orientalists have never yet been initiated all their alleged clues to the contrary. Do go to, let us go down and there confound their language that, they may not understand one another's speech. Genesis 11h Having done with modern physical sciences we next turn to western philosophies and religions. Every one of these is equally based upon, and derives its theories and doc. Trines from heathen, and moreover, exoteric thought. This can easily be traced from Schopenhauer and Mr. Herbert Spencer, down to hypnotism and so-called mental science. The German philosophers modernize Buddhism, the English are inspired by Vedantism, while the French, borrowing from both, add to them Plato, in a Phrygian cap, and occasionally, as with Augusta Comte, the weird sex worship or mariolatry of the old Roman Catholic ecstatics and visionaries. New systems, eclept philosophical, new sex and societies, spring up nowadays in every corner of our civilized lands. But even the highest among them agree on no one point, though each claims supremacy. This, because no science, no philosophy being at best, but a fragment broken from the wisdom religion can stand alone, or be complete in itself. Truth, to be complete, must represent an unbroken continuity. It must have no gaps, no missing links. And which of our modern religions, sciences, or philosophies, is free from such defects? Truth is one. Even as the palest reflection of the Absolute, it can be no more dual than is absoluteness itself, nor can it have two aspects. But such truth is not for the majorities, in our world of illusion especially for those minds which are devoid of the noetic element. These have to substitute for the high spiritual and quasi-absolute truth the relative one, which having two sides or aspects, both conditioned by appearances, lead our brain minds one to intellectual scientific materialism, the other to materialistic or anthropomorphic religiosity. But even that kind of truth, in order to offer a coherent and complete system of something, has, while naturally clashing with its opposite, 
to offer no gaps and contradictions, no broken or missing links, in the special system or doctrine it undertakes to represent. And here a slight digression must come in. We are sure to be told by some, that this is precisely the objection taken to theosophical expositions, from Isis unveiled down to the secret doctrine. Agreed. We are quite prepared to confess that the latter work, especially, surpasses in these defects all the other theosophical works. We are quite ready to admit the faults charged against it by its critics that it is badly arranged, discursive, overburdened with digressions into byways of mythology, etc., etc. But then it is neither a philosophical system nor the doctrine, called secret or esoteric, but only a record of a few of its facts and a witness to it. It has never claimed to be the full exposition of the system, it advocates, in its totality, a, because as the writer does not boast of being a great initiate, she could, therefore, never have undertaken such a gigantic task, and, b, because had shop been one, she would have divulged still less. It has never been contemplated to make of the sacred truths an integral system for the ribaldry and sneers of a profane and iconoclastic public. The work does not pretend to set up a series of explanations, complete in all their details, of the mysteries of being, nor does it seek to win for itself. The name of a distinct system of thought like the works of Messrs. Herbert Spencer, Schopenhauer, or Kant. On the contrary, the secret doctrine merely asserts that a system, known as the wisdom religion, the work of generations of adepts and seers, the sacred heirloom of prehistoric times actually exists, though hitherto preserved in the greatest secrecy by the present initiates, and it points to various corroborations of its existence to this very day, to be found in ancient and modern works. Giving a few fragments only, it there shows how these explain the religious dogmas of the present day, and how they might serve Western religions, philosophies, and science, as signposts along the untrodden paths of discovery. The work is essentially fragmentary, giving statements of sundry facts taught in the esoteric schools kept, so far, secret by which the ancient symbolism of various nations is interpreted. It does not even give the keys to it, but merely opens a few of the hitherto secret drawers. No new philosophy is set up in the secret doctrine, only the hidden meaning of some of the religious allegories of antiquity is given, light being thrown on these by the esoteric sciences, and the common source is pointed out, whence all the world religions and philosophies have sprung. Its chief attempt is to show, that however divergent the respective doctrines and systems of old may seem on their external or objective side, the agreement between all becomes perfect, so soon as the esoteric or inner side of these beliefs end. Their symbology is examined and a careful comparison made. It is also maintained that its doctrines and sciences, which form an integral cycle of universal cosmic facts and metaphysical axioms and truths, represent a complete and unbroken system, and that he who is brave and persevering enough, ready to crush the animal in himself, and forgetting the human self, sacrifices it to his higher ego, can always find his way to become initiated into these mysteries. This is all the secret doctrine claims. Are not a few facts and self-evident truths, found in these volumes all. The literary defects of the exposition notwithstanding, truths already proved practically to some, better than the most ingenious working hypotheses, liable to be upset any day, than the unexplainable mysteries of religious dogmas, or the most seemingly profound philosophical speculations. Can the grandest among these speculations be really profound, when from their alpha to their omega they are limited and conditioned by their author's bro slash n mind, hence dwarfed and crippled on that procrustean bed, cut down to fit limited sensuous perceptions which will not allow the intellect to go beyond their enchanted circle? No philosopher who views the spiritual realm as a mere figment of superstition, and regards man's mental perceptions as simply the result of the organization of the brain, can ever be worthy of that name. Nor has a materialist any right to the appellation, since it means a lover of wisdom, and Pythagoras, who was the first to coin the compound term, never limited wisdom to this earth. 
one who affirms that the universe and man are objects of the senses only, and who fatally chains thought within the region of senseless matter, as do the Darwinian evolutionists, is at best a sophiophobe when not a philosopher never a philosopher. Therefore is it that in this age of materialism, agnosticism, evolutionism, and false idealism, there is not a system, however intellectually expounded, that can stand on its own legs, or fail to be criticized by an exponent from another school of thought as materialistic as itself, even Mr. Herbert Spencer, the greatest of all, is unable to answer some criticisms. Many are those who remember the fierce polemics that raged a few years ago in the English and American journals between the evolutionists on the one hand and the positivists on the other. The subject of the dispute was with regard to the attitude and relation that the theory of evolution would bear to religion. Mr. F. Harrison, the apostle of positivism, charged Mr. Herbert Spencer with restricting religion to the realm of reason, forgetting that feeling and not the cognizing faculty, played the most important part in it. The erroneousness and insufficiency of the ideas on the unknowable as developed in Mr. Spencer's works were also taken to task by Mr. Harrison. The idea was erroneous, he held, because it was based on the acceptation of the metaphysical absolute. It was insufficient, he argued, because it brought deity down to an empty abstraction, void of any meaning. Three to this the great English writer replied, that he had never thought of offering his unknowable and incognizable, as a subject for religious worship. Then stepped into the arena, the respective admirers and defenders of Messrs. Spencer and Harrison, some defending the material metaphysics of the former thinker, if we may be permitted to use this paradoxical yet correct definition of Mr. Herbert Spencer's philosophy, others, the arguments of the godless and Christless Roman Catholicism of Augusta Comte, for both sides giving and receiving very hard blows. Thus, Count D'Alviella of Brussels, five suddenly discovered in Mr. H. Spencer a kind of hidden, yet reverential theist, and compared Mr. Harrison to a casuist of medieval scholasticism. It is not to discuss the relative merits of materialistic evolutionism, or of positivism either, that the two English thinkers are brought forward, but simply to point, as an illustration, to the Babel-like confusion of modern thought. While the evolutionists, of Herbert Spencer's school, maintain that the historical evolution of the religious feeling consists in the constant abstraction of the attributes of deity, and their final separation from the primitive concrete conceptions this process rejoicing in the easy-going triple compound of denthropomorphization, or the disappearance of human attributes the COMTists on their side hold to another version. They affirm that fetishism, or the direct worship of nature, was the primitive religion of man, a too protracted evolution alone having landed it in anthropomorphism. Their deity is humanity and the god they worship, mankind, as far as we understand them. The only way, therefore, of settling the dispute, is to ascertain which of the two philosophical and scientific theories, is the less pernicious and the more probable. Is it true to say, as D. Alviella assures us, that Mr. Spencer's unknowable contains all the elements necessary to religion, and, as that remarkable writer is alleged to imply, that religious feeling tends to free itself from every moral element, or, shall we accept the other extremity and agree with the COMTists? That gradually, religion will three as the above is repeated from memory, it does not claim to be quoted with verbal exactitude, but only to give the gist of the argument. For the epithet is Mr. Huxley's. In his lecture in Edinburgh in 1868, on the physical basis of life, this great opponent remarked that Augusta Comte's philosophy in practice might be compendiously described as Catholicism minus Christianity, and antagonistic to the very essence of science. 5. Professor of Ecclesiastical History at the University of Brussels, in a Philosophy. Cal essay on the religious meaning of the unknowable. Blend itself with, merge into, and disappear in altruism and its service to humanity. Useless to say that theosophy, while rejecting the one-sidedness and therefore the limitation in both ideas, is alone able to reconcile the two, i.e., 
the evolutionists and the positivists on both metaphysical and practical lines. How to do this it is not here the place to say, as every theosophist acquainted with the main tenets of the esoteric philosophy can do it for himself. We believe in an impersonal unknowable and know well that the absolute, or absoluteness, can have not to do with worship on anthropomorphic lines, theosophy rejects the Spencerian he and substitutes the impersonal it for the personal pronoun, whenever speaking of the absolute and the unknowable. And it teaches, as foremost of all virtues, altruism and self-sacrifice. Brotherhood and compassion for every living creature, without, for all that, worshipping man or humanity. In the positivist, moreover, who admits of no immortal soul in men, believes in no future life or reincarnation, such a worship becomes worse than fetishism, it is zoolatry, the worship of the animals. For that alone which constitutes the real man is, in the words of Carlyle, the essence of our being, the mystery in us that calls itself T. A breath of heaven, the highest being reveals himself in man. This denied, man is but an animal the shame and scandal of the universe, as Pascal puts it. It is the old, old story, the struggle of matter and spirit, the survival of the unfittest, because of the strongest and most material. But the period when nascent humanity, following the law of the natural and dual evolution, was descending along with spirit into matter is closed. We, humanity, are now helping matter to ascend toward spirit, and to do that we have to help substance to disenthrall itself from the viscous grip of sense. We, of the fifth root race, are the direct descendants of the primeval humanity of that race, those, who on this side of the flood tried, by commemorating it, to save the antediluvian truth and wisdom, and were worsted in our efforts by the dark genius of the earth the spirit of matter, whom the Gnostics called Ildabaoth and the Jews Jehovah. Think ye, that even the Bible of Moses, the book you know so well and understand so badly, has left this claim of the ancient doctrine without witness. It has not. Allow us to close with a, to you, familiar passage, only interpreted in its true light. In the beginning of time, or rather, in the childhood of the fifth race, the whole earth was of one lip and of one speech, Seth chapter 11 of Genesis. Read esoterically, this means that mankind had one universal doctrine, a philosophy, common to all, and that men were bound by one religion, whether this term be derived from the Latin word religira, to gather, or be united in speech or in thought, from religions, revering the gods, or, from religare, to be bound fast together. Take it one way or the other, it means most undeniably and plainly that our forefathers from beyond the flood accepted in common one truth i.e., they believed in that aggregate of subjective and objective facts which form the consistent, logical, and harmonious whole called by us the wisdom. Religion Now, reading the first nine verses of chapter 11 between the lines, we get the following information. Wise in their generation, our early fathers were evidently acquainted with the imperishable truism which teaches that in union alone lies strength in union of thought as well as in that of nations, of course. Therefore, lest in disunion they should be scattered upon the face of the earth, and their wisdom religion should, in consequence, be broken up into a thousand fragments, and lest they, themselves, instead of towering as hitherto, through knowledge, heavenward, should, through blind faith begin gravitating earthward the wise men, who journeyed from the east, devised a plan. In those days temples were sites of learning, not of superstition, priests taught divine wisdom, not man invented dogmas, and the ultima thule of their religious activity did not center in the contribution box, as at present. Thus go to, they said, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name. And they made burnt brick and used it for stone, and built there with a city and a tower. So far, this is a very old story, known as well to a Sunday school. Ragamuffin as to Mr. Gladstone. Both believe very sincerely that these descendants of the accursed Ham were proud sinners whose object was like that of the Titans, to insult and dethrone Zeus Jehovah, by reaching heaven, 
the supposed abode of both. But since we find the story told in the revealed six scripts, it must, six a curious and rather unfortunate word to use, since, as a translation from the Latin revelar, it signifies diametrically the opposite of the now accepted meaning in English. For the word to reveal or revealed is derived from the Latin revelar, to reveal and not to reveal, i.e. from re again or back and ve slash or to veil, or to hide something, from the word velum or a veil, or veil, a cover. Thus, instead, like all the rest in them, have its esoteric interpretation. In this, occult symbolism will help us. All the expressions that we have italicized, when read in the original Hebrew and according to the canons of esoteric symbolism, will yield quite a different construction. Thus, I and the whole earth, mankind, was of one lip, Eli, proclaimed the same teachings, and of the same words not of speech as in the authorized version. Now the Kabbalistic meaning of the term words and word may be found in the Zohar and also in the Talmud. Words, Dabarim, mean powers, and word, in the singular, is a synonym of wisdom, e.g., by the uttering of ten words was the world created, Talmud Perki both see. 5. Mish. I, here the words refer to the ten Sephiroth, builders of the universe. Again, by the word, wisdom, logos, of YHVH were the heavens made, Ibid. 2 to 4 and the man 7, the chief leader, said to his neighbor, go to, let us make bricks, disciples, and burn them to a burning, initiate, fill them with sacred fire, let us build us a city, establish mysteries and teach the doctrine 8, and a tower, ziggurat, a sacred temple tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, the highest limit reachable in space. The great tower of Nebo, of Nabi on the temple of Bel, was called the house of the seven spheres of heaven and earth, and the house of the stronghold, or strength, Tejamit, and the foundation stone of heaven and earth. Occult symbology teaches, that to burn bricks for a city means to train disciples for magic, a hewn stone signifying a full initiate, Petra the Greek and Kephas the Aramaic word for stone, having the same meaning, viz, interpreter of the mysteries, a hierophant. The supreme initiation was referred to as the burning with great burning. Thus, the bricks are fallen, but we will of unveiling, or revealing, Moses has truly only revealed once more the Egypto-Chaldean theological legends and allegories, into which, as one learned in all the wisdom of Egypt he had been initiated. Yet Moses was not the first revealer or revealer. As Ragan well observes, thousands of years before him Hermes was credited with veiling over the Indian mysteries to adapt them for the land of the pharaohs. Of course, at present there is no longer classical authority to satisfy the orthodox philologist, but the occult authority which maintains that originally the word revelar meant to veil once more, and hence that revelation means the throwing a veil over a subject, a blind is positively overwhelming. 7. This is translated from the Hebrew original. Chief leader, Rav Mag, meaning literally teacher magician, master, or guru, as Daniel is shown to have been in Babylon. 8. Some Homeric heroes al o when they are said, like Laomedon. Priam's father, to have built cities, were in reality establishing the mysteries and introducing the wisdom religion in foreign lands. Build, anew, with hewn stones of Isaiah becomes clear. For the true interpretation of the four last verses of the genetic allegory about the supposed confusion of tongues we may turn to the legendary version of the Zedis and read verses 5, 6, 7, and 8 in Genesis, ch. 11, esoterically, and Adonai, the Lord, came down and said, Behold, the people is one, the people are united in thought and deed, and they have one lip, doctrine, dot. And now they begin to spread it and nothing will be restrained from them, they will have full magic powers and get all they want by such power, cryozacti, that they have imagined. And now what are these Adis and their version and what is Adona? Ad is the Lord, their ancestral god, and these Adis are a heretical Musulman sect, 
scattered over Armenia, Syria, and especially Mosul, the very site of Babel, see Chaldean account of Genesis, who are known under the strange name of devil worshippers. Their confession of faith is very original. They recognize two powers or gods Allah and Ad, or Adonai, but identify the latter with Shaitan or Satan. This is but natural since Satan is also a son of God 9, see Job T. As stated in the Hibbert Lectures, pages 346 and 347, Satan the adversary, was the minister and angel of God. Hence, when questioned on the cause of their curious worship of one who has become the embodiment of evil and the dark spirit of the earth, they nine it is commanded in Ecclesiasticus XXI, 30, not to curse Satan, lest one should forfeit his own life. Why? Because in their permutations the Lord God, Moses, and Satan are one. The name the Jews gave while in Babylon to their exoteric God, the substitute for the true deity of which they never spoke or wrote was the Assyrian Masha or Adar, the god of the scorching sun, the Lord thy God is a consuming flame verily, and therefore, Masha or Moses, Shni also. In Egypt Typhon, Satan, the Red, was identified both with the Red Ass or Typhon called Set or Seth, and worshipped by the Hittites, and the same as El, the sun god of the Assyrians and the Semites, or Jehovah, and with Moses, the Red, also. See Isis UNV. Volume 2. 523-24, for Moses was red-skinned. According to the Zohar, Val. IP 28, 8 Sard Masha Sumak. I.e., the flesh of Moses was deep red, and the words refer to the saying, the face of Moses was like the face of the sun, see Kabbalah by Isaac Meyer p. 93, these three were the three aspects of the manifested God, the substitute for and sup the infinite deity, or nature, in its three chief kingdoms the fiery or solar, the human, or watery, the animal or earthy. There never was a Moshe or Moses, before the captivity and Ezra, the deep Kabbalist, and what is now Moses had another name 2000 years before. Where are the Hebrew scrolls before that time? Moreover, we find a corroboration of this in Dr. Seis's Hibbert Lectures, 1887. Adar is the Assyrian war god or the lord of hosts and the same as Moloch. The Assyrian equivalent of Masha, Moses, is Aesu, the double or the twin, and Masu is the title of Adar, meaning also a hero. No one who reads carefully the said lectures from page 40 to 58, can fail to see that Jehovah, Masu, and Adar, with several others are per mu. Had ions. Explain the reason in a most logical, if irreverent, manner. They tell you that Allah, being all good, would not harm the smallest of his creatures. Ergo, has he no need of prayers, or burnt offerings of the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof? But that their ad, or the devil, being all bad, cruel, jealous, revengeful, and proud, they have, in self-preservation, to propitiate him with sacrifices and burnt offerings smelling sweet in his nostrils, and to coax and flatter him. Ask any sheikh of the cities of Mosul what they have to say, as to the confusion of tongues, or speech when Allah came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had builded, and they will tell you it is not Allah but Ad, the god Shaitan, who did it. The jealous genius of the earth became envious of the powers and sanctity of men, as the god Vishnu becomes jealous of the great powers of the yogis, even when they were deities, and therefore this deity of matter. And concupiscence confused their brains, tempted and made the builders fall into his nets, and thus, having lost their purity, they lost their with their knowledge and magic powers, intermarried and became scattered upon the face of the earth. This is more logical than to attribute to one's god, the all. Good such ungodly tricks as are fathered upon him in the Bible. Moreover, the legend about the Tower of Babel and the confusion of speech, is like much else, not original, but comes from the Chaldeans and Babylonians. George Smith found a version on a mutilated fragment of the Assyrian tablets, 
though there is nothing said in it about the confusion of speech. I have translated the word speech with a prejudice, he says, Chaldean account of Genesis, p. 163, I have never seen the Assyrian word with this meaning. Anyone who reads for himself the fragmentary translation by G. Smith, on pages 160 to 163 in the volume cited, will find the version much nearer to that of the Zadis than to the version of Jean S. It is he, whose heart was evil and who was wicked, who confused their counsel, not their speech, and who broke the sanctuary, which carried wisdom, and bitterly they wept at Babel. And so ought to weep all the philosophers and lovers of ancient wisdom, for it is since then that the thousand and one exoteric substitutes for the one true doctrine or lip had their beginning, obscuring more and more the intellects of men, and shedding innocent blood in tears fanaticism. Had our modern philosophers studied, instead of sneering at, the old books of wisdom say the Kabbalah they would have found that which would have unveiled to them many a secret of ancient church and state. As they have not, however, the result is evident. The dark cycle of Kali Yug has brought back a babel of modern thought, compared with which the confusion of tongues itself appears a harmony. All is dark and uncertain, no argument in any department, neither in sciences, philosophy, law, nor even in religion. But, woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, saith Isaiah. The very elements seem confused and climates shift, as if the celestial upper ten themselves had lost their heads. All one can do is to sit still and look on, sad and resigned, while the slack sail shifts from side to side, the boat untrim d admits the tide, borne down adrift, at random toss d. The oar breaks short, the rudders lost. The 17 raid sun disc the following interesting letter was received by us from Fresno, California. As it is a private one, we can give but extracts from it. Ed. Exploring Copan and Cuenca in Honduras and Guatemala last year, I had the good fortune to make a discovery, which I am sure will interest you. As you are aware, the most prominent sculptured monuments in Copan consist of four-sided columns of from 10 to 12 feet high. These columns represent generally only on one side large sculptured personages in high relief. The other sides again contain ornaments and glyphic inscriptions, hitherto not read or deciphered. One pillar not previously described, however, contains only hieroglyphics arranged on all sides. It seems to be a record perhaps of laws, perhaps of historical events. This pillar is about 10 feet high, and the sides 3 and 4 feet wide respectively. But the most remarkable is that this pillar was covered by a cap in the shape of a very low truncate pyramid. On this pyramid was seen a forced dead head of colossal dimensions and surrounding the same was an expanded sun disk, crowning the very cap. The rays of the sun disk were distinctly marked. The similarity of the same and the sun disks common in the Egyptian monuments was so marked, that it immediately struck me that the number of rays must be 17, the sacred number of the Egyptian sun disk. Upon counting the rays they were found to be as expected 17. Now is this a pure coincidence or is it another link in the broken and scattered chain, whose finding points toward an ancient connection between the Central American peoples, the Mayas, and other races, and the Egyptians by means of a con. Necting Atlantis Another curiosity, naturally a coincidence, is worthy of notice. One of these sculptured personages dressed in priestly robes and holding in his hand a small square box. Has his legs above the sandals ornamented with the crescent. The same sign was used by the Romans to signify immortality and similarly placed above the sandals. Cannot your trans-Himalayan brothers give us any clue to these hieroglyphics inscribed on the Central American monuments? Or have you no psychomet Elists who could decipher them psychometrically? If anyone should be willing to try to do so, I would send him a small portion of one of the glyphs I have in my possession, and maybe some good will come out of it. E.g. Editor's Note Assuredly the discovery mentioned in the above letter, the pillar with its 17-rayed sun disk, p. 
points once more to an ancient connection between the Central American peoples and the lost continent of Atlantis. The uniformity in the symbolical meanings of American antiquities, and of antiquities connected with the wisdom religion in Egypt or any other parts of Europe or Asia where they may be observed, is certainly far more remarkable than would be agreeable to theorists who wish to account for it by help of that heart. Work Servant Coincidence It has been traced with great patience through many different departments of archaeology by Mr. Donnelly in his recent Atlantis, or the Antediluvian World. The second part of the title of this volume, by the by, will not be quite acceptable to students of the subject who approach it from the side of occult science. The deluge is better left alone until cosmogony is more generally understood than at present. There is no one deluge that can conveniently be taken as a turning point in the world's history asterisk with everything before that antediluvian, and everything of later date post-diluvian. There have been many such deluges cutting the various races of mankind at the appointed time in their development. The situation has already been referred to in the Fragments of Occult Truth. During the occupation of the Earth for one period by the great tidal wave of humanity, seven great races are successively developed, their end being in. Every case marked by a tremendous cataclysm which changes the face of the Earth in the distribution of land and water. The present race of mankind, as often stated, is the fifth race. The inhabitants of the great continent of Atlantis were the fourth race. When they were in their prime, the European continent was not in existence as we know it now, but nonetheless was there free communication between Atlantis and such portions of Europe as did exist, and Egypt. The ancient Egyptians themselves were not an Atlantic colony Mr. Donnelly is mistaken on that point, but the wisdom religion of the initiates was certainly identical and hence the identities of symbolical sculpture. This is what the Himalayan brothers say, whether any of our psychometrists will see any further, depends on the degree of their development, at any rate, we accept the offer of our esteemed correspondent with thanks and will expect the promised portion of the glyph, before we venture to say anything further. A mysterious race W. Heil traveling from the landing place on the Madras Buckingham Canal to Nellery, we were made to experience the novel sensation of a transit of 15 miles in comfortable modern carriages each briskly dragged by a dozen of strong, merry men, whom we took for ordinary hin. Dus of some of the lower or pariah caste. The contrast offered us by the sight of these noisy, apparently well-contented men to our palanquin bearers, who had just carried us for 55 miles across the sandy, hot plains that stretch between Padagangam on the same canal and Gunto or as affording relief was great. These palanquin bearers, we were told, were of the washerman's caste, and had hard times working night and day, never having regular hours for sleep, earning but a few pies a day, and when the pies had the good chance of being transformed into annas, existing upon the luxury of a mud soup made out of husks and damaged rice, and called by them pepper water. Naturally enough, we regarded our human carriage steeds as identical with the palanquin bearers. We were speedily disabused, being told by one of our brother members Mr. Kazavapalai, secretary to our Nellery Theosophical Society that the two classes had nothing in common. The former were low-caste Hindus, the latter Yanadis. The information received about this tribe was so interesting, that we now give it to our readers, as we then received it. Who are the Yanadis? The word Yanadi is a corruption of the word Anatha, Aborigines, meaning having no beginning. The Yanadis live mostly in the Nellery district, Madras Presidency, along the coast. They are divided into two classes, one, Kapala or Chala, frog eaters, refuse eaters, and, two, the Yanadis proper, or the good Yanadis. The first class lives, as a rule, separated from the Sudra population of the district, and earns its living by hard work. The Kapala are employed to drag carts and carriages in lieu of cattle, as horses are very scarce and too expensive to maintain in this district. The second class, or Yanadis proper, live partly in villages and partly in the jungles, assisting the farmers in tilling the land, as in all other agricultural occupations. 
yet both classes are renowned for their mysterious knowledge of the occult properties of nature, and are regarded as practical magicians. Both are fond of sport and great hunters of rats and bandicoots. They catch the field mouse by digging, and the fish by using simply their hands without the usual help of either angle or net. They belong to the Mongolian race, their color varying from light brown to a very dark sepia shade. Their dress consists of a piece of cloth to tie around the head, and of another one to go round the waist. They live in small circular huts of about 8 feet in diameter, having an entrance of about leapy. In width. Before building the huts they describe large circles round the place where the huts are to be built, muttering certain words of magic, which are supposed to keep evil spirits, influences, and snakes from approaching their dwelling places. They plant round their huts certain herbs believed to possess the virtue of keeping off venomous reptiles. It is really astonishing to find in those little huts two dozens of persons living, for a Yanati rarely has less than a dozen of children. Their diet consists chiefly of rats, bandicoots, field mice, kangi, guano, and little rice even wild roots often forming part of their food. Their diet, in a great measure, explains their physical peculiarities. Field mice account partly for their having so many children each. They live to a good old age, and it is only very seldom that one sees a man with gray hairs. This is attributed to the starch in the kangi they daily drink, and the easy and careless lives they lead. Their extraordinary merit consists in the intimate knowledge they possess of the occult virtues of roots, green herbs, and other plants. They can extract the virtue of these plants, and neutralize the most fatal poisons of venomous reptiles, and even very ferocious cobras are seen to sink their hoods before a certain green leaf. The names, identity, and the knowledge of these plants they keep most secret. Cases of snake bite have never been heard of among them, though they live in jungles and the most insecure places, whereas death by snake bite is common among the higher. A mysterious race classes. Devil possession is very seldom among their women. They extract a most efficacious remedy, or rather a decoction from more than a hundred different roots, and it is said to possess incalculable virtues for curing any malady. In cases of extreme urgency and fatal sickness they consult their seer, often one for twenty or twenty-five families, who invokes their tutelary deity by sounding a drum, with a woman singing to it, and with a fire in front. After an hour or two he falls into a trance, or works himself into a state, during which he can tell the cause of the sickness, and prescribe a certain secret remedy, which, when paid and administered the patient is cured. It is supposed that the spirit of the deceased, whose name they have dishonored, or the deity whom they have neglected, tells them through the medium of the seer, why they were visited with the calamity, exacts of them promise of good behavior in future, and disappears after an advice. It is not unfrequently that men of high caste, such as Brahmins, have had recourse to them for such information, and consulted with them with advantage. The seer grows his hair and lets no razor pass his head. The Anadis shave their heads with the sharp end of a glass piece. The ceremonies of naming a child, marriage, and journeys, and such other things, are likewise consulted. They possess such an acute sense of smell, or rather sensitiveness, that they can see where a bird they require is, or where the object of their game is hiding itself. They are employed as guards and watchmen for the rare power they have in finding and tracing out a thief or a stranger from his footmarks. Suppose a stranger visited their village at night, a Yanati could say that the village was visited by him, a stranger, by simply looking at the footsteps. Christmas then and Christmas now we are reaching the time of the year when the whole Christian world is preparing to celebrate the most noted of its solemnities the birth of the founder of their religion. When this paper reaches its western subscribers, there will be festivity and rejoicing in every house. In northwestern Europe and in America the holly and ivy will decorate each home, and the church is bedecked with evergreens a custom derived from the ancient practices of the pagan druids that sylvan spirits might flock to the evergreens, and remain unipped by frost till a milder season. In Roman Catholic countries large crowds flock during the whole evening and night of Christmas Eve to the churches, 
to salute waxen images of the Divine Infant, and His Virgin Mother, in her garb of Queen of Heaven. To an analytical mind, this bravery of rich gold and lace, pearl-broidered satin and velvet, and the bejeweled cradle do seem rather paradoxical. When one thinks of the poor, worm-eaten, dirty manger of the Jewish country in, in which, if we must credit the Gospel, the future Redeemer was placed at his birth for lack of a better shelter, we cannot help suspecting that before the dazzled eyes of the unsophisticated devotee the Bethlehem stable vanishes altogether. To put it in the mildest terms, this gaudy display tallies ill with the democratic feelings and the truly divine contempt for riches of the Son of Man, who had not where to lay his head. It makes it all the harder for the average Christian to regard the explicit statement that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, as anything more than a rhetorical threat. The Roman Church acted wisely in severely forbidding her parishioners to either read or interpret the Gospels for themselves, and leaving the book, as long as it was possible, to proclaim its truths in Latin the voice of one crying in the wilderness. In that, she but followed the wisdom of the ages the wisdom of the old Aery. ANS, which is also justified of her children, for, as neither the modern Hindu devotee understands a word of the Sanskrit, nor the modern Parsi one syllable of the Zend, so for the average Roman Catholic the Latin is no better than hieroglyphics. The result is that all the three Brahmanical high priest, Zoroastriart Mobd, and Roman Catholic pontiff, are allowed unlimited opportunities for evolving new religious dogmas out of the depths of their own fancy, for the benefit of their respective churches. To usher in this great day, the bells are set merrily ringing at midnight, throughout England and the continent. In France and Italy, after the celebration of the Mass in churches magnificently decorated, it is usual for the revelers to partake of a collation, revelon, that they may be better able to sustain the fatigues of the night, saith a book treating upon popish church ceremonials. This night of Christian fasting reminds one of the Sivaratri of the followers of the god Siva the great day of gloom and fasting, in the 1-1th month of the Hindu year. Only, with the latter, the night's long vigil is preceded and followed by a strict and rigid fasting. No reveal lawns or compromises for them. True, they are but wicked heathens, and therefore their way to salvation must be tenfold harder. Though now universally observed by Christian nations as the anniversary of the birth of Jesus, the 25th of December was not originally so accepted. The most movable of the Christian feast days, during the early centuries, Christmas was often confounded with the Epiphany, and celebrated in the months of April and May. As there never was any authentic record or proof of its identification, whether in secular or ecclesiastical history, the selection of that day long remained optional, and it was only during the 4th century that, urged by Cyril of Jerusalem, the Pope, Julius I, ordered the bishops to make an investigation, and come finally to some agreement as to the presumable date of the Nativity of Christ. Their choice fell upon the 25th day of December, and a most unfortunate choice it has since proved. It was Dupuy, followed by Volney, who aimed the first shots at this natal anniversary. They proved that for incalculable periods before our era, upon very clear astronomical data, Nearly all the ancient peoples had celebrated the births of their sun gods on that very day. Dupuy shows that the celestial sign of the Virgin and Child was in existence several thousand years before Christ remarks Higgins in his Anacalypsis. As Dupuy, Volney and Higgins have all been passed over to posterity as infidels, and enemies of Christianity, it may be as well to quote, in this rela. Chin, the Confessions of the Christian Bishop of Ratisbonne, the most learned man that the Middle Ages produced the Domini. Ken, Albertus Magnus. The sign of the Celestial Virgin rises above the horizon at the moment in which we fix the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, in the Recherches Historiques sur Phalos, P.A.R. Langevon Pretra. So Adonis, Bacchus, Osiris, Apollo, etc., were all born on the 25th of December. Christmas comes just at the time of the winter solstice, the days then are shortest, 
and darkness is more upon the face of the earth than ever. All the sun gods were believed to be annually born at that epoch, for from this time its light dispels more and more darkness with each succeeding day, and the power of the sun begins to increase. However it may be, the Christmas festivities, that were held by the Christians for nearly fifteen centuries, were of a particularly pagan character. Nay, we are afraid that even the present ceremonies of the church can hardly escape the reproach of being almost literally copied from the mysteries of Egypt and Greece, held in honor of Osiris and Horus, Apollo and Bacchus. Both Isis and Ceres were called holy virgins, and a divine babe may be found in every heathen religion. We will now draw two pictures of the Merry Christmas, one portraying the good old times, and the other the present state of Christian worship. From the first days of its establishment as Christmas, the day was regarded in the double light of a holy commemoration and a most cheerful festivity, it was equally given up to devotion and insane merriment. Among the revels of the Christmas season were the so-called Feasts of Fools and of Asses, grotesque Saturnalia, which were termed December Liberties, in which everything serious was burlesqued, the order of society reversed, and its decencies ridiculed says one compiler of old chronicles. During the Middle Ages, it was celebrated by the gay fantastic spectacle of dramatic mysteries, performed by personages in grotesque masks and singular costumes. The show usually represented an infant in a cradle, surrounded by the Virgin Mary and Saint Joseph, by bulls' heads, cherubs, Eastern Magi, the mobs of old, and manifold ornaments. The custom of singing canticles at Christmas, called carols, was to recall the songs of the shepherds at the nativity. The bishops and the clergy often joined with the populace in caroling, and the songs were enlivened by dances, and by the music of tambours, guitars, violins, and organs. We may add that down to the present times, during the days preceding Christmas, such mysteries are being enacted, with marionettes and dolls, in southern Russia, Poland, and Galicia, and known as the Kolodowki. In Italy, Calabrian minstrels descend from their mountains to Naples and Rome, and crowd the shrines of the Virgin Mother, cheering her with their wild music. In England, the revels used to begin on Christmas Eve, and continue often till Candlemas, February 2nd, every day being a holiday till Twelfth Night, January. 6. In the houses of great nobles a Lord of Misrule, or Abbot of Unreason was appointed, whose duty it was to play the part of a buffoon. The larder was filled with capons, hens, turkeys, geese, ducks, beef, mutton, pork, pies, puddings, nuts, plums, sugar, and honey. A glowing fire, made of great logs, the principle of which was termed the Yule Log, or Christmas Block, which might be burnt till Candlemas Eve, kept out the cold, and the abundance was shared by the lords. Tenants amid music, conjuring, riddles, hot cockles, fool plow, snapdragon, jokes, laughter, repartees, forfeits, and dances. In our modern times, the bishops and the clergy join no more with the populace in open caroling and dancing, and feasts of fools and of asses are enacted more in sacred privacy than under the eyes of the dangerous argus eyed reporter. Yet the eating and drinking festivities are preserved throughout the Christian world, and, more sudden deaths are doubtless caused by gluttony and intemperance during the Christmas and Easter holidays, than at any other time of the year. Yet, Christian worship becomes every year more and more a false pretense. The heartlessness of this lip service has been denounced innumerable times, but never, we think, with a more affecting touch of realism than in a charming dream tale, which appeared in the New York Herald about last Christmas. An aged man, presiding at a public meeting, said he would avail himself of the opportunity to relate a vision he had witnessed on the previous night. He thought he was standing in the pulpit of the most gorgeous and magnificent cathedral he had ever seen. Before him was the priest or pastor of the church, and beside him stood an angel with a tablet and pencil in hand, whose mission it was to make record of every act of worship or prayer that transpired in his presence and ascended as an acceptable offering to the throne of God. Every pew was filled with richly attired worshippers of either sex. 
The most sublime music that ever fell on his enraptured ear filled the air with melody. All the beautiful ritualistic church services, including a surpassingly eloquent sermon from the gifted minister, had in turn transpired, and yet the recording angel made no entry in his tablet. The congregation were at length dismissed by the pastor with a lengthy and beautifully worded prayer, followed by a benediction, and yet the angel made no sign. Attended still by the angel, the speaker left the door of the church in rear of the richly attired congregation. A poor, tattered castaway stood in the gutter beside the curbstone, with her pale, famished hand extended, silently pleading for alms. As the richly attired worshippers from the church passed by, they shrank from the poor Magdalen, the ladies withdrawing aside their silken, jewel-bedecked robes, lest they should be polluted by her touch. Just then an intoxicated sailor came reeling down the sidewalk on the other side. When he got opposite the poor forsaken girl, he staggered across the street to where she stood, and, taking a few pennies from his pocket, he thrust them into her hand, accompanied with the adjuration, Here, you poor forsaken cuss. Take this. A celestial radiance now lighted up the face of the recording angel, who instantly entered the sailor's act of sympathy and charity in his tablet, and departed with it as a sweet sacrifice to God. A concretion, one might say, of the biblical story of the judgment upon the woman taken in adultery. Be it so, yet it portrays with a master hand the state of our Christian society. According to tradition, on Christmas Eve, the oxen may always be found on their knees, as though in prayer and devotion, and, there was a famous hawthorn in the churchyard of Glastonbury Abbey, which always budded on the 24th, and blossomed on the 25th of December, which, considering that the day was chosen by the fathers of the church at random, and that the calendar has been changed from the old to the new style, shows a remarkable perspicacity in both the animal and the vegetable. There is also a tradition of the church, preserved to us by Olaus. Archbishop of Upsal, that, at the festival of Christmas, the men, living in the cold northern parts, are suddenly and strangely metamorphosed into wolves, and that a huge multitude of them meet together at an appointed place and rage so fiercely against mankind, that it suffers more from their attacks than ever they do. From the natural wolves. Metaphorically viewed, this would seem to be more than ever the case with men, and particularly with Christian nations, now. There seems no need to wait for Christmas Eve to see whole nations changed into wild beasts especially in time of war. Lucifer, October, 1891 The Eighth Wonder by an unpopular philosopher, written in 1889, J.U.S.T. Back from under the far-reaching shadow of the Eighth Wonder of the World the gigantic iron carrot that goes by the name of the Eiffel Tower. Child of its country, wondrous in its size, useless in its object, as shaky and vacillating as the republican soil upon which it is built, it has not one single moral feature of its seven ancestors, not one trait of atavism to boast of. The architectural leviathan of 1889 is not even in the question of usefulness on a par with the New York Statue of Liberty, that would be rival of the ancient Pharos. It is simply one of the latest fungi of modern commercial enterprise, grown on the soil of cunning speculation, in order to attract numberless flies in the shape of tourists from the four points of the world which it very conscientiously does. Even its splendid engineering does not add to its usefulness, but forces even an unpopular philosopher to exclaim, Vanitas vanitatum, omnia vanitas. Shall modern civilization still lift its nose and sneer at its ancient and elder sister? The wonders of the world, the seven marvels of the pagans. Will never be replaced in our days. M. de Lesseps admirers may look contemptuously back on the causeway built by Dexaphanes, three centuries before our conceited era, but the astral atoms of himself, as those of his son, so straight as the Nidian, may rest undisturbed and need feel no jealousy. The architecture of the marble tower of Pharos erected to the gods, the saviors, for the benefit of sailors has hitherto remained unrivaled, in the public good derived from it, at all events. And this we may say, despite the creation of the Long Island Statue of Liberty. 
for verily, all the wonders of our age are destined to become but the ephemera of the century that is slowly approaching us, while they remain but the dreams and often the nightmares of the present era. All this will surely pass away and be no more. A seismic breath in Egypt may occur tomorrow and the earth will then open her mouth and swallow the waters of the canal of Suez, and it will become an impassable bog. A terremotos, or worse still a succussatory, as they are called in South America, may lift the Long Island with its liberty and toss them both a hundred feet high in the blue air, but to drop them down, C.O.V. Airing their watery grave with the never-drying salt tears of the Atlantic Ocean. Who can tell? Non dies pro evident tantum sed et divini in genil viri seth sly cicero in his De Divinitione, treating of cosmic phenomena. And the same thing threatens Lutetia that was, or Paris that is, and our own British Isles. No, never has God predicted as much as has the divine intellect of man, surely not. Nor would Cicero's feelings change, had he ever read the war cry in his day or entertained a couple of Adventists. And what would be Cicero, after all, in the presence of a modern materialist? How would he feel? I asked myself. Would he confess himself nonplussed, or would he remark as Job did to the new philosopher, his persecutor hast thou not poured, modern, wisdom out as milk and curdled it like cheese, enough to show us what it is? Where are ye, O relics of the departed pagan glories? Shall we? Suspect in you solar myths, or hope that we see a reincarnation of the hanging gardens of Babylon in the glass and iron whale and its two gigantic glass umbrella sticks named the Crystal Palace Building. Avant such insulting thoughts. The restless idolon if any be left of haughty Samiramis can still admire her work in the astral gallery of eternal images, and call it unparalleled. The mausoleum of Artemisia remains unrivaled by that of the proudest raised only to the gods of the stock exchange, the destroyers of mutual capital. Fane of the Ephesian Diana, what temple shall ever equal thee in poetry? Modern statues, whether equestrian or pedestrian, that now fill the halls of the French exhibition, which of you can ever put to blush the astral idolon of the Olympian Jupiter by Phidias? To which of the sculptors or painters of our proud era shall a Modern Philippus of Thessalonica address the words spoken to the divine Greek artist, O Phidias, either the god has descended from heaven on earth to show himself to thee, or it is thou who hast ascended to contemplate the god. No doubt but we are, not, the people, and wisdom was, not, born with us, nor shall it die with us, let us add. Long rows of pottery and bronzes, of cunning weapons, toys, and shoes and other wares are daily inspected by admiring crowds on the exhibition grounds. Well, the unpopular philosopher would unhesitatingly exchange all these for a glance at the collection of Mr. Flinders Petrie now to be viewed at Oxford mansions. Those unique treasures have been just exhumed on the site of the Cahun, of the 12th dynasty. Between the industry of the 6th century AD, and that of the Tsith BC, Excepting, to avoid a quarrel, the chronology of the modern antiquarians and excavators, the palm must be awarded to the latter, and it is easy to show why. All these weapons, domestic and agricultural implements, foreign weights, necklaces, toys, colored threads, textiles, and shoes now on view, have that unique feature about them that they carry us back to the days of Enoch and Methuselah, on the authority of biblical chronology. The exhibits, we are told, relate to the 12th dynasty 2600 years BC, if we have to believe archaeological calculations, i.e., they show to us what kind of shoes were worn 250 years before the deluge. The idea alone that one may be gazing at the very sandals that have, perhaps, dropped from the feet of the first grand master and founder of masonry, Enoch, when God took him, must fill the heart of every Masonic believer in Genesis with reverential delight. Before such a grand possibility, into what pale insignificance dwindles down the pleasure of inhaling the smell of Russian leather, in the shoe gallery at the Paris exhibition. No believer in godly Enoch, the firstborn of Cain Seth Jared, Canuck the Initiator, no true Mason ought to run over to gay Paris, 
with such a treasure within his reach. But we have still the pyramids of Egypt left to us to admire and unravel if we can. The pyramid of Cheops is the sphinx and wonder of our century, as it was that of the age of Herodotus. We see only its skeleton, whereas the father of history examined it with its outer coating of immaculate marble. It was defiled, however, with the record of 1,600 talents one spent only in 1,444 pounds in English money. Radishes, onions, and garlic for the workmen. Let us pause, before we turn our olfactory organ from the emanations of such unpoetical food. For with the ancients was wisdom, though it passeth now our understanding. Let us hesitate before we pass judgment lest we should be caught in our own craftiness. The said onions and garlic may be as symbolical as the Pythagorean beans. Let us humbly wait till better understanding descends upon us. Quien sabe? The beautiful outer casing of both the pyramids of Cheops and Senseophis has disappeared, engulfed in the palaces of Cairo and other cities. And with them are gone inscriptions and engraved records and cunning hieratratic symbols. Does not the father of history confess his dislike to speaking of things divine, and does he not avoid dwelling on symbology? Let us seek light and help from the great learned orientalists, the artificers of Greek speech and Akkadian lampsuk. We have hitherto learned many a strange story. Perchance we may be yet told that these radishes, onions, and garlic are but so many solar myths and blush for our ignorance. But what was the fate of the last of the seven wonders of the world? Where are we to look for the relics of the brazen giant, the Colossus of Rhodes, whose mighty feet trod upon the two moles which formed the gate of the harbour and between whose legs ships passed full sail, and sailors hurried with their votive offerings. History tells us that the chef de suver of the disciple of Lysippus, who passed twelve years in making it, was partially destroyed by an earthquake 224 BC. It remained for about 894 years in ruins. Historians are not in the habit of telling people what became of the remains of the six wonders, nor that every great nation possessed its seven wonders witness China, which had its porcelain tower of Nanking, to now, as says a writer, only found. Piecemeal in walls of peasants' huts. Yet it is rumored in some old chronicles that the poor Colossus was sold to a Jew. Queer volumes may be found at times in the shops of old Russian dissenters at Moscow. One of such is a thick infoglio in two guts taff, History China. Vol. I, P 372. The Slavonian language called, the Axe, Clerical and Lay, from the Chronicles of Baronius, collected in old monasteries, translated from the Polish and printed in the metropolis of Moscow, in the year of the Lord 1791 in this very curious volume full of archaic facts and statements, historical and long forgotten. Records beginning with the year I, one can read under the year AD 683, on page 706, the following, the Saracen having destroyed and despoiled the Roman land seizeth not his wicked depredation even on the sea. One their leader Magavius, strong and terrible, returneth to Rhodos the island, mark hate to the brazen idol, whose name was Colossus, sick, the idol exalted as the seventh world wonder, and which stood over the Rhodos harbor. His height was twenty and one hundred feet, stopa, dot asterisk soil covered and moss grown was the idol since its upper part fell to the ground, but he had remained otherwise whole to that very day. Magavius overthrew the trunkless legs and sold them with the rest to a Jew. Sad was the end of that world wonder. And elsewhere the chronographer adds that the Jew's name was Aaron of Edessa. He is not the only one to volunteer the information. Other old writers add that the Jew having broken up the Colossus, with the help of the Saracen warriors, into pieces, loaded 900 camels with them. The value of the brass material reached 36,000 pounds English money in the eastern markets. Sick transit Gloria Mundi. Before the Jew and the Musulman, moreover, the Rhodians themselves are said to have received large sums of money from pious donors to repair and put up the Colossus anew. But they cheated their gods and their fellow men. They divided the money, the honest trustees, 
and put an end to legal inquiry by throwing the blame on the Delphic Oracle, which had forbidden them, as they averred, to restore the Colossus from its ruins. And thus ended the last of the wonders of the old pagan world, to make room for the wonder of the Christian era the ever-speculating, money-making Jew. There is a legend in Slavonian folklore or three the original of this passage being written in Old Church Slavonian can hardly be translated in all its originality, which is very queer. For some classics give it only 105 feet feet or 70 cubits. Shall we say a prophecy? That after the lapse of untold ages, when our globe will have become decrepit and old through wear and tear, underground speculation and geological zeal, this best of the worlds possible in drive. Pangloss estimation shall be bought at auction by the Jews broken up for old metal, pounded into a formless heap, and rolled into balls as shears. After which the sons of Jacob and Abraham will squat around the sorry relics on their haunches, and hold counsel as to the best means of transferring it to the next Jewish bazaar and palming off the defunct globe on some innocent Christian in search of a second-hand planet. Such is the legend. Se non e vero e ben trovato. At any rate the prophecy is suggestive even if allegorical. For indeed, if the Colossus of Rhodes could be sold for old brass to one Jew with such facility, then every crowned Colossus in Europe has reason to tremble for his fate. Why should not every sovereign thus pass, one after the other, into the hands of the Jew in general, since they have been in that clutching grasp for some time already? If the reader shakes his head and remarks on this that the royal colossi are not made of brass, but occupy their respective thrones by the grace of God and are God's anointed he will be meekly told that as the Lord giveth, so the Lord taketh and that he is no respecter of persons. Besides which there is somehow or somewhere karma involved in that business. Few are those potentates who do not find themselves head over ears golden thrones and breadless subjects in debt with one or other king of Jewry. After all, the Lord, by whose grace they are all enthroned, from the late king so look to the latest prince of Bulgaria, is the same El Shaddai, the omnipotent, the mighty Jehovah Isabioth, the God whom they, or their fathers which is all one to him to whom a thousand years are as one day have unlawfully carried off from his holy, of holies and confined in their own altars. The sons of Israel are, in fact and justice, his legitimate children, his chosen people. Hence it would only be a piece of retributive justice, a kind of tardy nemesis, should the day come when the Jew, claiming his own, shall carry off as old material the last of the kings, before. He proceeds to paint afresh, as new goods, the globe itself. HPB. The theory of cycles IT is now some time since this theory, which was first propounded in the oldest religion of the world, Vedaism, then taught by various Greek philosophers, and afterwards defended by the Theosophists of the Middle Ages, but which came to be flatly denied by the wise men of the West, like everything else, in this world of negation, has been gradually coming into prominence again. This once, contrary to the rule, it is the men of science themselves who take up. Statistics of events of the most varied nature are fast being collected and collated with the seriousness demanded by important scientific questions. Statistics of wars and of the periods, or cycles, of the appearance of great men at least those as have been recognized as such by their contemporaries and Irrespective of later opinions, statistics of the periods of development and progress at large commercial centers, of the rise and fall of arts and sciences, of cataclysms, such as earthquakes, epidemics, periods of extraordinary cold and heat, cycles of revolutions, and of the rise and fall of empires, and see, all these are subjected. In turn to the analysis of the minutest mathematical calculations. Finally, even the occult significance of numbers in names of persons and names of cities, in events, and like matters, receives unwanted attention. If, on the one hand, a great portion of the educated public is running into atheism and skepticism, on the other hand, we find an evident current of mysticism forcing its way into science. It is the sign of an irrepressible need in humanity to assure itself that there is a power paramount over matter, 
an occult and mysterious law which governs the world, and which we should rather study and closely watch, trying to adapt ourselves to it, than blindly deny, and break our heads against the rock of destiny. More than one thoughtful mind, while studying the fortunes and reverses of nations and great empires, has been deeply struck by one identical feature in their history, namely, the inevitable recurrence of similar historical events reaching in turn every one of them, and after the same lapse of time. This analogy is found between the events to be substantially the same on the whole, though there may be more or less difference as to the outward form of details. Thus, the belief of the ancients in their astrologers, soothsayers, and prophets might have been warranted by the verification of many of their most important predictions, without these prognostications of future events implying of necessity anything very miraculous in themselves. The soothsayers and augurs having occupied in days of the old civilizations the very same position now occupied by our historians, astronomers, and meteorologists, there was nothing more wonderful in the fact of the former predicting the downfall of an empire or the loss of a battle, than in the latter predicting the return of a comet, a change of temperature, or, perhaps, the final conquest of Afghanistan. The necessity for both these classes being acute, observers apart, there was the study of certain sciences to be pursued then as well as they are now. The science of today will have become an ancient science a thousand years hence. Free and open, scientific study now is to all, whereas it was then confined but to the few. Yet, whether ancient or modern, both may be called exact sciences, for, if the astronomer of today draws his observations from mathematical calculations, the astrologer of old also based his prognostication upon no less acute and mathematically correct observations of the ever-recurring cycles. And, because the secret of this science is now being lost, does that give any warrant to say that it never existed, or that, to believe in it, one must be ready to swallow magic, miracles and the like stuff? If, in view of the eminence to which modern science has reached, the claim to prophesy future events must be regarded as either a child's play or a deliberate deception, says a writer in the Novoi Vremya, the best daily paper of literature and politics of St. Petersburg, then we can point at science which, in its turn, has now taken up and placed on record the question, in its relation to past events, whether there is or is not in the constant repetition of events a certain periodicity, in other words, whether these events recur after a fixed and determined period of years with every nation. And if a periodicity there be, whether this periodicity is due to blind chance or depends on the same natural laws, on which are more or less dependent many of the phenomena of human life. Undoubtedly the latter. And the writer has the best mathematical proof of it in the timely appearance of such works as that of Dry Vesus, under review, and of a few others. Several learned works, treating upon this mystical subject, have appeared of late, and of some of these works and calculations we will now treat the more readily as they are in most cases from the pens of men of eminent learning. Having already in the June number of the Theosophist noticed an article by Drive. Blowitz on the significance of the number seven, with every nation and people a learned paper which appeared lately in the German journal Die Gegenart we will now summarize the opinions of the press in general, on a more suggestive work by a well-known German scientist, E. Zis, with certain reflections of our own. It has just appeared in the Prussian Journal of Statistics, and powerfully corroborates the ancient theory of cycles. These periods, which bring around ever-recurring events, begin from the infinitesimal small say of 10 years rotation and reach to cycles which require 250, 500, 700, and 1000 years, to effect their revolutions around themselves, and within one another. All are contained within the Mahayug the great age or cycle of the Manu calculation, which itself revolves between two eternities the pralayas or nights of Brahma. As, in the objective world of matter, or the system of effects, the minor constellations and planets gravitate each and all around the sun, so in the world of the subjective, or the system of causes, these innumerable cycles all gravitate between that which the finite intellect of the ordinary mortal regards as eternity, and the 
still finite, but more profound, intuition of the sage and philosopher views as but an eternity within the eternity. As above, so it is below, runs the old hermetic maxim. As an experiment in this direction, doctors have selected the statistical investigations of all the wars, the occurrence of which has been recorded in history, as a subject which lends itself more easily to scientific verification than any other. To illustrate his subject in the simplest and most easily comprehensible way, Dr. Zis represents the periods of war and the periods of peace in the shape of small and large wave lines running over the area of the old world. The idea is not a new one, for, the image was used for similar illustrations by more than one ancient and medieval mystic, whether in words or picture by Henry Coonrod, for example. But it serves well its purpose and gives us the facts we now want. Before he treats, however, of the cycles of wars, the author brings in the record of the rise and fall of the world's great empires, and shows the degree of activity they have played in the universal history. He points out the fact that if we divide the map of the old world into five parts into Eastern, Central, and Western Asia, Eastern and Western Europe, and Egypt then we will easily perceive that. Every 250 years, an enormous wave passes over these areas, bringing into each in its turn the events it has brought to the one next preceding. This wave we may call the historical wave of the 250 year cycle. The reader will please follow this mystical number of years. The first of these waves began in China, 2000 years BC. The golden age of this empire, the age of philosophy, of discoveries, and reforms. In 1750 BC, the Mongolians of Central Asia establish a powerful empire. In 1500, Egypt rises from its temporary degradation and carries its sway over many parts of Europe and Asia, and about 1250, the historical wave reaches and crosses over to Eastern Europe, filling it with the spirit of the Argonautic expedition, and dies out in 1000 BC. At the Siege of Troy a second historical wave appears about that time in Central Asia. The Scythians leave her steps, and inundate towards the year 750 BC. The adjoining countries, directing themselves towards the south and west, about the year 500 in Western Asia begins an epoch of splendor for ancient Persia, and the wave moves on to the east of Europe, where, about 250 BC, Greece reaches her highest state of culture and civilization and further on to the west, where, at the birth of Christ, the Roman Empire finds itself at its apogee of power and greatness. Again, at this period we find the rising of a third historical wave at the Far East. After prolonged revolutions, about this time, China forms once more a powerful empire, and its arts, sciences, and commerce flourish again. Then 250 years later, we find the Huns appearing from the depths of Central Asia, in the year 500 AD. A new and powerful Persian kingdom is formed, in 750 in Eastern Europe the Byzantine Empire, and, in the year 1,000 on its western side springs up the second Roman power, the Empire of the Papacy, which soon reaches an extraordinary development of wealth and brilliancy. At the same time, the fourth wave approaches from the Orient. China is again flourishing, in 1250, the Mongolian wave from Central Asia has overflowed and covered an enormous area of land, including with it Russia. About 1500, in Western Asia, the Ottoman Empire rises in all its might and conquers the Balkan Peninsula, but at the same time in Eastern Europe, Russia throws off the Tartar yoke, and about 1750, during the reign of Empress Catherine, rises to an unexpected grandeur and covers itself with glory. The wave ceaselessly moves further onto the west, and, beginning with the middle of the past century, Europe is living over an epoch of revolutions and reforms, and, according to the author, if it is permissible to prophetize, then, about the year 2000, Western Europe will have lived one of those periods of culture and progress so rare in history. The Russian press, taking the cue, believes that towards those days the Eastern question will be finally settled, 
the national dissensions of the European peoples will come to an end, and the dawn of the new millennium will witness the abolishment of armies and an alliance between all the European empires. The signs of regeneration are also fast multiplying in Japan and China, as if pointing to the approach of a new historical wave at the extreme east. If, from the cycle of two and a half century duration, we descend to those which leave their impress every century, and, grouping together the events of ancient history, will mark the development and rise of empires, then we will assure ourselves that, beginning from the year 700 BC, the centennial wave pushes for Ward, bringing into prominence the following nations each in its turn the Assyrians, the Medes, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Macedonians, the Carthaginians, the Romans, and the Germanians. The striking periodicity of the wars in Europe is also noticed by Dry Vesus. Beginning with 1700 AD, every ten years have been signalized by either a war or a revolution. The periods of the strengthening and weakening of the warlike excitement of the European nations represent a wave strikingly regular in its periodicity, flowing incessantly, as if propelled onward by some invisible fixed law. This same mysterious law seems at the same time to make these events coincide with astronomical wave or cycle, which, at every new revolution, is accompanied by the very marked appearance of spots in the sun. The periods, when the European powers have shown the most destructive energy, are marked by a cycle of 50 years duration. It would be too long and tedious to enumerate them from the beginning of history. We may, therefore, limit our study to the cycle beginning with the year 1712, when all the European nations were fighting at the same time the Northern, and the Turkish wars, and the war for the throne of Spain. About 1761, the Seven Years' War, in 1810 the wars of Napoleon I towards 1861, the wave has a little deflected from its regular course, but, as if to compensate for it, or, propelled, perhaps, with unusual forces, the years directly preceding, as well as those which followed it, left in history the records of the most fierce and bloody war the Crimean War in the former period, and the American Rebellion in the latter one. The periodicity in the wars between Russia and Turkey appears peculiarly striking and represents a very characteristic wave. At first the intervals between the cycles, returning upon themselves, are of 30 years duration 1710, 1740, 1770, then these intervals diminish, and we have a cycle of 20 years 1790, 1810, 1829 to 30, then the intervals widen again 1853 and 1878. But, if we take note of the whole duration of the inflowing tide of the warlike cycle, then we will have at the center of it from 1768 to 1812 three wars of seven years duration each, and, at both ends, wars of two years. Finally, the author comes to the conclusion that, in view of facts, it becomes thoroughly impossible to deny the presence of a regular periodicity in the excitement of both mental and physical forces in the nations of the world. He proves that in the history of all the peoples and empires of the old world, the cycles marking the millenniums, the centennials as well as the minor ones of 50 and 10 years duration, are the most important, inasmuch as neither of them has ever yet failed to bring in its rear some more or less marked event in the history of the nation swept over by these historical waves. The history of India is one which, of all histories, is the most vague and least satisfactory. Yet, were its consecutive great events noted down, and its annals well searched, the law of cycles would be found to have asserted itself here as plainly as in every other country in respect of its wars, famines, political exigencies, and other matters. In France, a meteorologist of Paris went to the trouble of compiling the statistics of the coldest seasons, and discovered, at the same time, that those years, which had the figure 9 in them, had been marked by the severest winters. His figures run thus, in 859 AD, 
the northern part of the Adriatic Sea was frozen and was covered for three months with ice. In 1179, in the most moderate zones, the earth was covered with several feet of snow. In 1209, in France, the depth of snow and the bitter cold caused such a scarcity of fodder that most of the cattle perished in that country. In 1249, the Baltic Sea, between Russia, Norway, and Sweden remained frozen for many months and communication was held by slaves. In 1339, there was such a terrific winter in England, that vast numbers of people died of starvation and exposure. In 1409, the river Danube was frozen from its sources to its mouth in the Black Sea. In 1469 all the vineyards and orchards perished in consequence of the frost. In 1609, in France, Switzerland and Upper Italy, people had to thaw their bread and provisions before they could use them. In 1639, the harbour of Marseilles was covered with ice to a great distance. In 1659 all the rivers in Italy were frozen. In 1699 the winter in France and Italy proved the severest and longest of all. The prices for articles of food were so much raised that half of the population died of starvation. In 1709 the winter was no less terrible. The ground was frozen in France, Italy, and Switzerland, to the depth of several feet, and the sea, south as well as north, was covered with one compact and thick crust of ice, many feet deep, and for a considerable space of miles, in the usually open sea. Masses of wild beasts, driven out by the cold from their dens in the forests, sought refuge in villages and even cities, and the birds fell dead to the ground by hundreds. In 1729, 1749 and 1769, cycles of twenty years duration, all the rivers and streams were icebound all over France for many weeks, and all the fruit trees perished. In 1789, France was again visited by a very severe winter. In Paris, the thermometer stood at 19 degrees of frost. But the severest of all winters proved that of 1829. For 54 consecutive days, all the roads in France were covered with snow several feet deep, and all the rivers were frozen. Famine and misery reached their climax in the country in that year. In 1839 there was again in France a most terrific and trying cold season. And now the winter of 1879 has asserted its statistical rights and proved true to the fatal influence of the figure 9. The meteorologists of other countries are invited to follow suit and make their investigations likewise, for the subject is certainly one of the most fascinating as well as instructive kind. Enough has been shown, however, to prove that neither the ideas of Pythagoras on the mysterious influence of numbers, nor the theories of ancient world religions and philosophies are as shallow and meaningless as some two forward free thinkers would have had the world to believe. Ancient doctrines vindicated by modern prophecy T. He German Press has recently attempted in numerous editorials to solve what seems a mystery to the ordinary and skeptical public. They feel that they are evidently betrayed by one of their own camp a materialist of exact science. Treating at length of the new theories of drive. Rudolf Falb the editor of the Leipzig popular astronomical journal, the serious they are struck with the faultless accuracy of his scientific prognostications, or rather to be plain, his meteorological and cosmological predictions. The fact is, that the latter have been shown by the sequence of events, to be less scientific conjectures than infallible prophecies. Basing himself upon some peculiar combinations and upon a method of his own, which, as he says, he has worked out after long years of researches and labor, drive. Falb is now enabled to foretell months and even years in advance every earthquake, remarkable storm, or inundation. Thus, for example, he foretold last year's earthquake at Zagril. At the beginning of 1868 he prophesied that an earthquake would occur on August 13, in Peru, and it did take place on that very day. 
In May 1869 he published a scientific work entitled The Elementary Theory of Earthquakes and Volcanic Eruptions, in which, among other prophecies, he foretold violent earthquakes at Marseilles, at Uduk, along the shores of the Austrian possessions in the Adriatic Sea, in Colombia, and the Crimea, which five months later in October actually took place. In 1873, he predicted the earthquake in northern Italy, at Belluno, which event occurred in the very presence of Dr. Falb, who had gone there to witness it himself, so sure was he of its taking place. In 1874, he notified to the world the then unforeseen and quite unexpected eruptions of Etna, and notwithstanding the chaff of his colleagues in science, who told him there was no reason to expect such a geological disturbance, he went to Sicily and was able to take his desired notes on the spot, when it did happen. He also prognosticated the violent storms and winds between the 23rd and the 26th of February 1877, in Italy, and that prediction was also corroborated by fact. Soon after that, Dr. Falb went to Chile, to observe the volcanic eruptions in the Andes which he had expected, and predicted two years before and he did observe them. Immediately upon his return, in 1875, appeared his most remarkable work known as Thoughts on, and Investigations of, the Causes of Volcanic Eruptions and which was immediately translated into Spanish and published at Valparaiso in 1877. After the predicted event at Zagreb had taken place, Dr. Falb was immediately invited to lecture in that city, where he delivered several remarkable discourses in which he once more warned the inhabitants of other forthcoming smaller earthquakes which, as is well known, did take place. The fact is that as was recently remarked by the Novoi Vremya, he has really worked out something, knows something additional to what other people know, and is better acquainted with these mysterious phenomena of our globe than any other specialist the world over. What is then his wonderful theory and new combinations? Two. Give an adequate idea of them would require a volume of comments and explanations. All we can add is, that Falb has said all he could say upon the subject in a huge work of his, called Diom Walrangen, I'm Welt All, in three volumes. In Vol. I, he treats of the revolutions in the stellar world, in Volume 2, of the revolutions in the regions of clouds, or of the meteorological phenomena, and in Vol ill of the revolutions in the bosom of the earth, or earthquakes. According to Dr. Falb's theory our universum is neither limitless nor eternal, but is limited to a certain time and circumscribed within a certain space. He views the mechanical construction of our planetary system and its phenomena in quite a different light than the rest of the men of science. He is very original, and very interesting, eccentric, in some respects, though we cannot trust him in everything seems the unanimous opinion of the press. Evidently, the doctor is too much of a man of science to be treated as a visionary or a hallucinated enthusiast, and so he is cautiously chaffed. Another less learned mortal would surely be, were he to expound the undeniably occult and cabalistic notions upon the cosmos that he does. Therefore, while passing over his theories in silence as if to avoid being compromised in the propagation of his heretical views, the papers generally add. We send the reader who may be curious to fathom the doctrines of drive. Rudolf Falb to the latest work of this remarkable man and prophet. Some add to the information given the fact that Dr. Falb's theory carries back the universal deluge to 4000 years BC, and presages another one for about the year 6500 of the Christian era. It appears that the theories and teaching of Dr. Falb are no new thing in this department of science, as 200 years ago, the theory was propounded by a Peruvian named Jory Valery, and about a century ago by an Italian called Toldo. We have, therefore, a certain right to infer that Dr. Falb's views are cabalistic, or rather those of the medieval Christian mystics and fire philosophers, both Bailery and Toldo having been practitioners of the secret sciences. At the same time though we have not yet been so fortunate as to have read his work that calculation of his, in reference to the Noachian deluge and the period of 6500 AD allotted for its recurrence, 
shows to us as plain as figures can speak that the learned doctor accepts for our globe the heliacal, great year, or cycle of six stars, at the close and turning point of which our planet, is always subjected to a thorough physical revolution. This teaching has been propounded from time immemorial and comes to us from Chaldea through Berisus, an astrologer at the Temple of Belus at Babylon. Chaldea, as is well known, was the one universal center of magic, from which radiated the rays of occult learning into every other country where the mysteries were enacted and taught. According to this teaching, believed in by Aristotle if we may credit Censorinus the great year consists of 21, 000 odd, years, the latter varying, or six Chaldean stars consisting of 3,500 years each. These two decimal and dot eums are naturally halved, the first period of 10,500 years bringing us to the top of the cycle and a minor cataclysm, the latter decimillennium to a terrible and universal geological convulsion. During these 21,000 years the polar and equatorial climates gradually exchange places, the former moving slowly towards the line and the tropical zone, replacing the forbidding wastes of the icy poles. This change of climate is necessarily attended by cataclysms, earthquakes, and other COSM eichel throws. As the beds of the ocean are displaced, at the end of every decimillennium and about one neros, 600 years, a semi-universal deluge like the legendary Bible flood is brought about. See Isis Unveiled, Vol. I, pages 30 to 31. It now remains to be seen how far Dr. Falb's theory and the old antediluvian teaching mentioned by the author of Isis Unveiled agree. At all events, as the latter work antedated by three years, his Dium Walrengen I'm Welt All which was published in 1881, but two months ago, the theory was not borrowed from the Leipzig astronomer's work. We may add that the constant verification of such geological and meteorological predictions besides its scientific value is of the utmost philosophical importance to the student of theosophy. For it shows, a, that there are few secrets in nature absolutely inaccessible to man's endeavors to snatch them from her bosom, and, b, that nature's workshop is one vast clockwork guided by immutable laws in which there is no room for the caprices of special providence. Yet he, who has fathomed the ultimate secrets of the produce nature which changes but is ever the same can, without disturbing the law, avail himself of the yet unknown correlations of natural force to produce effects which would seem miraculous and impossible, but to those who are unacquainted with their causes. The law which molds the tear also rounds the planet. There exists a wealth of chinric force in heat, light, electricity, and magnetism the possibilities of whose mechanical motions are far from being all understood. Why then should the theosophist who believes in natural, though occult, law be regarded as either a charlatan or a credulous fool in his endeavors to fathom its secrets? Is it only because following the traditions of ancient men of science the methods he has chosen differ from those of modern learning? ISIS Unveiled, A Master Key to the Mysteries of Ancient and Modern Science and Theology by H. P. Blavatsky Vol. I Science, XLV plus 628 pages. Vol 2 Theology, 4 plus 640 pp. This exhaustive study of religion and science was Madame Blavatsky's first presentation of theosophy to the modern world. It is reproduced in photographic facsimile of the original edition, 1877, two volumes bound in one, cloth, complete with general index and supplementary topical index, American edition The Secret Doctrine, The Synthesis of Science, Religion, and Philosophy by H. P. Blavatsky Vol. I. Cosmogenesis, Slady I plus 676 pages. Volume 2 Anthropogenesis, 14 plus 798 pages. A systematic development of theosophical teachings on cosmogenesis, anthropogenesis, symbolism, comparative religion, with extensive comparisons of ancient wisdom with scientific conceptions. Facsimile of original, 1888, edition, two volumes bound in one, cloth, complete with index, triple XPP.
American edition index to the secret doctrine, a volume and page reference to the original edition, London 1888, and to the photographic facsimile reproduction, listed above. Reprint X plus 172 pages. American edition The Key to Theosophy, an exposition, in question, and answer, of the ethics, science, and philosophy of theosophy by H. P. Blavatsky reprint of original edition, 1889, 15 plus 36 7 pages. Indian edition The Voice of the Silence, by H. P. Blavatsky a blank verse rendition of chosen fragments from the Book of the Golden Precepts, belonging to the contemplative or Mahayana, Yogacarya, school. Reprint of the original edition, 1889, 4 plus 79 pages, cloth. Indian edition Transactions of the Blavatsky Lodge, by H. P. Blavatsky reprint of the original, 1923, XXIV plus 149 pages, cloth. American edition The Ocean of Theosophy by William Q. Judge. A comprehensive text on the theosophical philosophy by a co-founder of the theosophical movement widely used as a text in study classes. Reprint of original edition, 1893, 15 plus 182 pages. Indian edition The Bhagavad Gita rendered into English by William Q. Judge An Ancient Dialogue of Philosophical Religion from the Hindu Epic, the Mahabharata, cloth, 18 plus 133 pages. Indian edition Notes on the Bhagavad Gita by W. Q. Judge Indian edition Letters that have helped me by W. Q. Judge American edition, and shorter Indian edition The Friendly Philosopher compiled from letters and talks by Robert Crosby, 415 pages, Cloth American Edition Universal Theosophy by Robert Crosby, Indian Edition Forthcoming Publications A Modern Pan Arion, by H. P. Blavatsky A Collection of Fugitive Fragments American Edition Five Years of Theosophy Essay Selected from the Theosophist American Edition Order from Theosophy Company, Mysore, Private Limited, 4, Sir Krishna Rao Road, Bangalore 560,004 India